Get ready for an adventure as we delve into the riveting tale of the Vandals. These Germanic warriors, hailing from modern-day Poland, catapulted themselves onto the stage of history during the tumultuous era of the Roman Empire. Brace yourselves for an awe-inspiring journey through triumphs, defeats, and the ultimate quest for power. The Vandals, a small Germanic tribe, were ready to prove themselves against the mighty Roman Empire. They fought valiantly in battles during the crisis of the 3rd century, but success eluded them. However, as fate would have it, they were granted land by none other than Constantine the Great. This was around the 3rd century. The Vandals had found their new home and stayed there for roughly 60 years, but trouble was brewing within the Empire. Chaos reigned supreme and the Vandals saw an opportunity. Fleeing from the dreaded Huns, they embarked on a daring journey westward, leaving a trail of anticipation and uncertainty in their wake. In 405, they waged wars in Gaul before eventually making their way to Iberia in 409. Rome, hoping for stability, granted the Vandals some land to settle in Iberia. However, this move backfired when the Visigoths invaded Iberia and crushed the Vandals. Seeking new opportunities, the Vandals turned their attention to Africa. Enter Gaiseric, the enigmatic leader who led the Vandals into Africa with a force of 80,000 people. With eyes set on the new horizons, they surged forward, leaving their mark along the African coastline. They advanced east along the coast, besieging the city of Hippo Regius in 430. It is here that the famous St. Augustine prayed for the Vandals to not sack the city. The Vandals were no ordinary Christians, my friends. They belonged to a heretical sect known as Arian Christians. Arians rejected the Trinity and believed that Jesus came from the Father. These unconventional beliefs set them apart from their Nicene Christian counterparts, and the tensions between the two added fuel to the fire. Despite St. Augustine's prayers, the Vandals captured Hippo Regius after a grueling 14th month siege. It's a battle of faith, power, and sheer determination as the Vandals lay siege to mighty cities defying all odds. In 439, Gaiseric laid siege to the great city of Carthage, eventually capturing it and making it his capital. The clash of fates and the looming question of destiny make this saga even more enthralling. The Vandals' thirst for conquest knew no bounds. They swept across the Mediterranean, capturing the islands of Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, Malta, and even the Balearic Islands. Rome was left reeling from the loss of their crucial grain basket in North Africa. Can you imagine the shockwaves reverberating throughout the empire at this time? As time went on, the Vandals faced internal turmoil with native Berbers and various Christian sects, but things began to stabilize for the barbarians. Just when you thought the story couldn't get any more dramatic, enter the Byzantines. The Byzantines were the remnants of the eastern portion of the Roman Empire. Led by the ambitious Emperor Justinian, they set their sights on reclaiming the lost territories of the west. But the Vandals were not going down without a fight. Clash of empires, clash of ideologies, and a battle for supremacy will leave you breathless. In 533, Justinian sent the brilliant general Belisarius to conquer Africa. Despite being vastly outnumbered by the barbarian hordes, Belisarius captured the Vandals and crushed their kingdom, ultimately dismantling it. The remaining Vandal population was shipped to Constantinople, while their soldiers were integrated into the Byzantine army. After the crushing defeat, the Vandals faded from history. Before we get into the video, I need your help. I recently became aware of a larger channel with the same name, so I'm going to change my channel name. I want your suggestions, so please comment below. I will take the most liked names and put them in a poll, so make sure to get your ideas in. And also, before we resume, please make sure to like and subscribe as it helps my channel a lot. Now, back to the video. Today we're exploring a fascinating deviation point in history that could have altered the course of the Vandals, their relationship with the Byzantine Empire, and history as we know it. Picture a world where the Vandals embraced Nicene Christianity, possibly influenced by the great theologian St. Augustine. In our alternate timeline, the Vandals make a pivotal decision, accepting Nicene Christianity. Perhaps the influential teachings of St. Augustine sway their beliefs while they were besieging Hippo. This shift would have significant consequences not only for the Vandals, but also for their future relations with the Byzantines. By embracing Nicene Christianity, the Vandals would eliminate the main justification for the Byzantines to wage war against them. The religious turmoil that contributed to their downfall in our timeline would be mitigated. This change, although seemingly subtle at first, sets the stage for a remarkable transformation in the Vandals' role in history. The Vandals would still engage in wars against the Western Roman Empire and establish their dominance by conquering territories such as Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, Malta, and the Balearic Islands. However, over time, the Vandals would evolve from being an anti-Roman and Byzantine force in the West to becoming a significant ally for the Byzantines in the next 150 years. In real life, the main reason for tension between the Byzantines and the Vandals was their discrimination of Nicene Christians, 
and if the Vandals were Nicaeans, the initial tension between the great powers would fade. Initially, relations in real life between the Vandals and Byzantines were complex. The Vandals were initially against the Byzantines, but eventually had several pro roman kings and maintained positive ties with the Byzantines as time went on. However, it is important to note that not all Vandals held favorable views of their Byzantine counterparts. One notable figure in this saga was Hilderic, a pro roman Vandal king who had a lenient approach towards Nicene Christians, and was coronated in 533. His mother's influence as a Nicene Christian played a significant role in shaping his tolerant stance, and raised him as a Nicene Christian. Unfortunately, a coup d'etat replaced Silderic, potentially because of his Nicene fate, with his anti-Roman and strict Aryan cousin, Gilimer, leading to a shift in Vandal policy. The renowned Byzantine historian Procopius described Hilderic as a close friend of Emperor Justinian, emphasizing the positive relationship between the Vandal king and the Byzantines. This coup played a major role in Justinian's decision to declare war on the Vandals. In our scenario, Hilderic is more popular and the coup doesn't take place, and because the Vandals are Nicene, Justinian would never declare war on them. Fast forward to the campaigns of Belisarius. In 533 AD, Justinian sent Belisarius to retake Italy, instead of Africa. But what's fascinating is that he received aid from the Vandals in our timeline. They formed a specialty unit akin to the Byzantine Varangians, strengthening Belisarius' force with an additional 5,000 Vandal troops. He landed in Regium in the spring. Belisarius witnessed a remarkable turn of events as southern Italian troops switched their allegiances from Theodahad to him, providing a significant boost in manpower. The march north to Neapolis was met with jubilation from the cities, delighted to see the return of Roman rule. He was leaning to the Ostrogothic forces, which caused most of them to join his cause. The Autohad, the Ostrogothic king, was deposed and replaced by Vitiges, mirroring real-life events. Belisarius, with overwhelming support, marched into Rome in October, capturing the city without a fight. The people celebrated the arrival of the Byzantine force, solidifying their control over the Italian cities of the south of the Po River. However, Vigis wasn't willing to surrender that easily. He marched on Rome in November to siege the city for a year. Eventually, Belisarius crushed Vigis' forces at the Battle of Bononia in 537, leading to the complete Byzantine domination of Italy. These swift and relatively bloodless wars in Italy had a profound impact on the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantines also controlled the Balkans, securing the path to Italy by both land and sea. Reuniting Italy with Rome was a significant achievement, and the financial strain often associated with the long and destructive wars was avoided. Instead, these wars were a massive increase in both land and money. Now let's shift our focus to the Lazic Wars against the Persians. In real life, the Byzantine forces are split in the west, allowing the Persian king, Castro I, to attack Germanus, Justinian's nephew, in 541. However, in this timeline, the Byzantines had already defeated the Ostrogoths, presenting a stronger front. Germanus, praised for his virtues, justice, and energy, successfully repelled the Persian invasion, preventing the slaughter of Antioch. Castro I was killed and the gates to Mesopotamia were opened. His death also led to mass political instability within Persia. Germanus took the initiative and reclaimed Armenia within the same year. Justinian recognized the opportunity to capitalize on this victory and received aid from Hilderic, his son Gundamar, leading an army. In 542, he sent Belisarius and Gundamar with a force of 40,000 Byzantine troops and 8,000 Vandal soldiers to aid Germanus. Together, they captured Mesopotamia from the Persians by 546. Pushing south, they forced the Persians across the Zagros Mountains. Border wars with the Sassanids ensued as the Byzantines aimed to prevent future instability. While it is highly unlikely that they would have been able to capture or retain Mesopotamia in real life. For the purposes of this video, we will assume they maintained control and engaged in numerous border wars and conflicts. Germanus would not die in the plague as he did in real world, but instead would go on to rule after Justinian. According to Procopius, his fame was such that soldiers, both Byzantines and barbarians, flocked to his banner, and so this would be massive. While having one or two excellent leaders may not seem like much of a change, the Roman Empire began with only a few good leaders who put it on a path for a millennium of success, so this may have occurred with the Byzantines. These conflicts were crucial to stabilizing the eastern borders of the Byzantine Empire. With Italy under their control, the alliance with the Vandals provided new troops and a reliable trade partner. Justinian's dream of a reconquered Rome was partially realized, and the empire enjoyed increased stability. 
The Vandals were a unique Germanic kingdom, distinct from their counterparts and their aspirations. While other Germanic kingdoms sought recognition as a legitimate Roman entity or a client state, the Vandals pursued a different path. They refused to be recognized as a Western Empire and instead aimed to establish themselves as a new and independent state. Despite their divergence from the Roman Empire, the Vandals adopted many of its systems. They maintained the provincial structure, adhered to the Roman tax system, and even modeled their troops after the Romans. This enabled the Vandal rule to provide a familiar lifestyle for the people, fostering contentment and facilitating the flourishment of arts and science. However, even in this alternate timeline, perpetual peace between the Vandals and Byzantines would be unlikely. Their relationship might resemble the dynamic between Athens and Sparta. Both powers would view themselves as the foremost Christian nations, similar to how Athens and Sparta saw themselves as the foremost Greek nations. Minor conflicts would likely arise over time as both powers realized their interdependence. They would engage in mutual wars when threatened and provide assistance to one another during major conflicts. For instance, the Vandals would aid the Byzantines in their wars against various Slavic tribes and kingdoms, while the Byzantines would support the Vandal efforts to quell Berber revolts. Now let's ponder the impact of the Muslim expansions. In this alternate timeline, it is possible that a strong Byzantine Empire, led by strong figures, would have quashed the Muslim expansion before it gained momentum. If the Muslims had faced the might of the Byzantines, they might have been confined to the Arabian Peninsula, much like the earlier Romans initially dealt with the Celts. The Byzantines in our timeline would treat them as wild barbarians that were a thorn but nothing major to worry about. Also consider this, if the Muslim expansion was halted at the start, they might have been unable to retain their momentum and resign themselves to Arabia. Muhammad may have been viewed in a similar way that Armenius was with the Germanic tribes. After banding together and failing to accomplish their main objective, Muslims may have turned on each other and broken back down into tribes and Islam may have faded away if there is no territorial boom. The Byzantines would build up border defenses and keep them permanently blocked in, preventing any outward path. Now let's explore the Vandals' potential influence in Spain. Instead of the Muslims, the Vandals would have been invited by Count Julian Suta to aid in their conquest. In real life, Count Julian invited the Muslims in because King Roderick violated his daughter. We will assume that the heinous situation still unfortunately occurred. The Vandals, now led by King Thrasimund III, with a formidable force of 14,000 men at his command, far larger than the 1,700 Muslims who historically invaded Spain in 711, set out to crush the Visigoths and establish Vandal control over the region. Thrasimund's first major encounter was at the Battle of Bates in July. Facing off against the Visigothic King Roderick, Thrasimund's force proved superior, and the Visigoths were swiftly defeated. Roderick died, and his death sent shockwaves throughout the Visigothic kingdom, plunging it into turmoil. Seizing the momentum of his victory, Thrasimund marched to Hispalis, and the city quickly capitulated to his forces. From there, he headed north and encountered some resistance from the Visigoths. However, through diplomacy and persuasion, Thrasimund convinced the Visigothic resistance to join his cause. He then turned south, capturing the important cities of Malacca and Iliberi. Thrasimund further solidified his hold on southern Iberia by dispatching 2,000 men to capture Arariola, while he effortlessly took control of Cordoba without facing any significant opposition. The major victory gave him a significant foothold in the region. In 712, Thrasimund set his victories on the Visigothic capital of Toledtun. After a grueling three-month siege, his forces emerged victorious, claiming the city for the Vandals. With Toledtun secured, Thrasimund marched westward, swiftly conquering Salamantica and Amerta Augusta by the end of the summer. By the end of 714, the cities of Ostarica, Legio, Palentia, Pompeilo, and Cesar Augusta all fell to Thrasimund's forces. Unlike the Muslim conquest that followed historically, there was no significant holdouts in the north. The Vandals, being Christian and of Germanic origins like the Visigoths, found more acceptance among the populace. The transition from a Visigothic Christian king to a Vandal Christian emperor was largely welcome, especially considering Roderick's unpopularity prior to his death. In just a few short years, Thrasimund's relentless campaign brought all of Iberia under Vandal control. The borders of Thrasimund's newfound empire evoked memories of another North African power, the ancient Punic Empire of Carthage. As time passed, news of another emerging power would reach the Vandals and Byzantines in the late 700s, that a remarkable event had unfolded in Gaul. The Wild Franks, previously divided and fragmented, had achieved an extraordinary feat. 
They had successfully unified the land under one banner, led by an almost mythical figure. This enigmatic conqueror had triumphed over Gaul, Germania, and even Britannia, regions once overrun with pagan tribes. The tide was turning as these savage lands were now being Christianized. Emerging from the darkness, a new player had arrived on the scene. He boldly claimed himself to be the true heir of the Western Roman Empire. His coronation, performed by Bishop Leo III, took place in Aachen, the new capital of the Franks. With the title Carolus Imperator Augustus, Charlemagne and his Carolingian Empire were poised to take their place among the true powers of Europe. Now let's ponder an intriguing question. Would the Vandals, Byzantines, and Carolingians work together as three great powers? Or would they turn on each other, potentially opening up a path for the Muslims to enter Europe? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. I'm eager to hear your insights, and remember, if we reach 3,000 likes of the video, I'll release a thrilling part 2 to explore the outcomes further. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to stay updated with our historical adventures. And be sure to click here to watch some of my other intriguing videos. Until next time, fellow history enthusiasts, goodbye.